Okay, to help you through this unit one practice sheet, I'm going to do a step-by-step -step guide. If you are confused, do the worksheet with me. If you are not confused, try the parts you're not confused about. Come back and get some help from me, okay? But I'm here to walk you through every single problem. You ready? All right, here we go. We are going to work on this practice sheet step-by-step. -step. We're gonna start with metric conversions. Well, to do metric conversions, what you should be looking at is table C here on your reference table. I'm going to remind you how to make the staircase. So I'm gonna use table C right here, and I'm going to build my staircase, okay? So I'm gonna start, what you have to remember is you put base units in the middle. What is base units? That's really anything pretty much that comes from here, from table D, but it's often grams, liters, meters, seconds, joules, pascals, a whole bunch of stuff, okay? Then I'm gonna look at kilo. Kilo's factor is 10 to the positive three. So from base units, I'm going to go up three and I'm gonna write kilo. Okay, next we have deci, minus one. So I'm gonna go down one from base unit and write deci. Centi is negative two. So I'm gonna go down two. Well, there was a one, so one more makes two. So that's centi. And then milli is negative three. So from base unit down three. One, two, three, milli. If I had to keep continuing, micro is negative six. So from base unit down one, two, three, four, five, six. I would continue like that. Okay, now that I have this conversion staircase, these conversions should be easy. So I take this measurement and I'm converting meters. That's where I'm starting. So I'm starting on base unit and I'm going to milli. So one, two, three. So I'm gonna go three, move the decimal place, place three places this way. So move the decimal point three places this way. So here's the decimal point, move it one, two, three, so it goes right there. So three, one, three, seven, okay? Now from milligrams to grams. So I'm going from mg, so I'm starting on milli this time, and I'm going up to grams, one, two, three, to base unit. So I'm going three, but this way. So I move my decimal point three places to the left. So I go one, I ran out of numbers, so I'm gonna add two, three, add two zeros. So it's gonna be a zero in front, right? That's the leading zero. Zero, zero is what I added. And then I have one, two, three, one, two, three there, right? And two, three, zero. There we go. All right, from joules to kilojoules. So I'm going from joules, base unit, up to kilo, so three this way. This number doesn't have a decimal point. So where is the decimal point? Right here at the end. So I go one, two, three. So 187. You could write the point zero, zero, zero. That would not be wrong. Um, or just 187 kilojoules. All right, let's go milliseconds to seconds. So milliseconds to base unit. That's three this way. So take my decimal point and I'm gonna move it one, two, three. I need to fill that space in with a zero. Put my leading zero, there we go. Kiloliters to liters. So this one, I'm starting on kilo and going one, two, three, three this way. So one, two, three, and I need to fill those in with zeros. So eight, three, seven, two, zero, zero liters. You could put the, zero, the decimal at the end, but it, in this case, it doesn't really matter. And let's look at the last one. Kilopascals to pascals. So kilo to base unit is three in this direction. So one, two, three. Now I don't write all of those leading zeros. I just write one. So there we go. That is metric conversions, okay?
Okay, my next section that we're looking at right here is metric units. This is easy peasy, it's just using table D. So I need to just look at table D and then I should be able to answer these questions. So what is the SI unit? That stands for the international system and it's gonna be this. So if you wanna make a note next to this, when we're talking about SI units, we're talking about what's here, okay? So quantity of heat, I can write J or the word joule pressure, pascal. So I'm going to kind of alternate between either writing the word, the name, or the symbol. Molarity, I have to write capital M, okay? Um, and let's see, temperature, Kelvin, or capital K. Remember that has absolute zero, the lowest uh, temperature, so it has no negative numbers. Amount of substance, we're talking about mole, short abbreviation, just M-O-L, and volume, so look down here, volume, here we go, liter, or capital L. And there we go, that's metric units. This should be easy peasy. You could write the name, you could write the symbol. The quantity is if you're asked for what is the unit for, you're gonna find it here. If you see a unit and you don't know what it stands for, look it up here and it'll tell you, okay? All right, we're moving on. We're gonna explain accuracy versus precision. So accurate is right answer, is the correct answer. And precision, started to spell that wrong, or precise, is repeatable, okay? What digit in a measurement is an educated guess? That is always the last digit. So the digit furthest to the right. So in this number, this is the guess, the estimated digit. In a graduated cylinder, you must measure from the bottom of the meniscus. What is that? So here's a quick drawing of a graduated cylinder right? You're going to have a volume and it's going to have a curve like this. You always measure from the bottom of the meniscus, not the top or the sides where it goes higher. So you always measure from the bottom of that curve. It's not going to be that pronounced. Typically it's going to have a little bit of a curve like this. And you have to make sure to measure from the bottom of that curve or meniscus. Okay, now we are going to look at significant figures. So for significant figures, uh, you should remember the Atlantic Pacific rule. So here's gonna be kind of my embarrassing, quick little map of the United States. Here we have the Atlantic side. Here we have the Pacific side. Atlantic stands for absent, meaning the decimal is absent. Pacific Pacific stands for present, meaning the decimal is present. When the decimal is absent, like in a number like this, we begin counting on the right side. Here's how I remember it. First of all, that's the right side of the United States. Also, if a number has no decimal, we imagine it has a decimal right here at the end. So I am going to start counting where that imaginary decimal is. And what I'm going to do is look. Is that a zero? Yes. Skip it. Is that a zero? Yes. Skip it. Is that a zero? Yes, skip it. Is that a zero? No, count it. One significant figure. But what if I have this? Okay, so again, no decimal. Start at this side. Zero, skip it. Zero, skip it. Zero, skip it. Not a zero, start here. Then we count everything. So I count all of these. Even though I have a zero here, it doesn't matter. Once I started counting with this one, I count everything. So that means one, two, three significant figures. Now we're gonna do the same thing if we have the decimal present, except we're gonna start on the opposite side, okay? So we're gonna start over here. Zero skip, zero skip, zero skip, one. One significant figure. And if we have this, zero skip, zero skip, zero skip, not a zero, start here, one, and then count everything, two, three. So they kind of follow the same rules, right? Just the map, meaning you skip any zeros at the end you start on. It just matters which side of the number you begin. So let's try it, okay? Here's the first one. I see a decimal, 
So I start on this side. That's not a zero. When it's not a zero, I just count everything. One, two, three, four. Four significant figures. Look at this one. It has a decimal. Start on this side. Skip, 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 skip. Oh, right here, start counting. One, two, three significant figures. This one. When it is in scientific notation, skip this. All that matters is this part, okay? There is a decimal, start over here. That's not a zero, so we count it all. Three. Let's look at this one. No decimal, start on the right side. Skip, 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 one, two. Two significant figures. Look at this one, there is a decimal, start on this side. Skip, skip, one, then keep counting all of them. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And this one, there is no decimal, start on this side. That is not a zero, so we count everything. One, two, three, four. And there you go, that's significant figures. Okay, now we're gonna look at significant figures calculations, okay? So let me just go over those rules really quickly. So we have rules for add and subtract, and we have rules for multiply and divide. So let me just show you an example. The rules for adding and subtracting are first, what you have to do is just add all of the numbers, okay? So say this is what I have. I just have to add all these numbers. So I had to make sure they were lined up right. So this is gonna be a four, three, three, you can use calculators, 16, carry the, okay. So I'm gonna get this number when I add them up. Hopefully that is the right answer. It appears it is this. Okay, now what I have to do is determine significant figures. For adding and subtracting, I definitely keep what's left of the decimal. So I know I will have 26, okay? Then I look at the numbers that I have, and I look at how many digits they have after the decimal point. That one has two after the decimal point. That one has one after the decimal point. That one has three after the decimal point. And that one has nothing, zero, after the decimal point. So I look at these numbers, the number of digits they had after the decimal point. Which one was the smallest number of digits? Well, zero. So that means this needs zero digits after the decimal. So that is my final answer. That's it. I round this to one digit after the decimal. And since this is a three, I do not round this up to 27. I keep it 26. Done, okay? So if I am multiplying or dividing, so let's just Uh, do an easy multiplication, right? Let's just make this two so the numbers are different so it's not so confusing. I'm gonna get, all right? So now I need to decide how many significant figures. Now for adding and subtracting, we look for lowest number of digits after the decimal point. For multiplying and dividing, we look for lowest total number of significant figures. So this has one, two, three significant figures. This has one, two significant figures. So that means my answer needs two significant figures. That's a zero, so I round down. So it's going to be this, okay? So that's the general rule. Let's try an example. So an aluminum sample has a mass of 80.01 80 grams and a density of 2.70 grams per centimeter cube. To what number of significant figures should the calculated volume be expressed? Well, the formula for density is mass over volume. Remember, you don't have to remember that. That's right here. So this is division and multiplication, right? So the rule for that is total sig figs. So this has four significant figures. This has three significant figures. So my answer needs to have the lower number of significant figures. So it should be to three. So I don't even need to calculate it. The question was simply asking how many significant figures. All right, let's check the next one. A sample of an element has a mass of 34.261 grams and a volume of 3.8 cubic centimeters. 
to which number of significant figures should the calculated density of the sample be expressed? So again, we're using the density formula. That's multiply and divide rule. That's total sig figs. So this one has five significant figures. This one has two. So what is the lower number of significant figures? Well, two. All right, and then this last one, this measurement rounded to three significant figures. So that's not significant. That's not significant. One, two, okay, three. Look at the next number. Well, that's a zero, so I round down. So zero, three, four, zero liters. That is three significant figures, okay? All right, let's look at this, which is density. Remember, my formula for density is on the reference table, so I'm going to write it down. Density equals mass over volume. I may need that formula. At 298 Kelvin in one atmosphere, which noble gas has the highest density? Okay, so I'm going to help you with this one. First, here you can see how we have 101.3 kPa and one atmosphere. So those are the same. So where am I finding density? If I have no other information, you should know that I'm looking at table S. But what you do need help with is what is a noble gas, okay? Well, the noble gases are right here, okay? So they are in uh, group 18, this last row. So we're gonna write down helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. And we're gonna look up the density of each one. So what will help is if you write the atomic number so uh, that you don't have to look too far, right? So you're not scrolling for the numbers. Uh, this will definitely help make looking at table S a little easier. So I'm gonna open up to table S. And why did that temperature, um, 298 Kelvin in one atmosphere matter? Remember down here it says it's 298 Kelvin. It says it's 101.3, but here it tells me those two things mean the same, okay? So I'm gonna look. Uh, so for helium, I have a very small number, 000164. For neon, I still have a small number, 0.000825. For argon, 0.001633. For krypton, Point zero zero three four two five. Oops, five. Xenon fifty four. Point zero zero five three six six, and then radon is point zero zero nine zero seven four. Go back to the question: Which has the highest density? Well, this is the smallest number, and they're getting bigger like this, so it is radon. What is the density of sodium? That's just a straightforward, look it up here. It is zero, 0 0.97, 0 0.97 grams per centimeter cubed, or you could say 0 0.97 grams per milliliter. A sample of an element has a mass of this and a volume of this. I wanna calculate the density. Here I do need this formula. So mass is 34.261. The volume is 3.8. Now I need to do that uh, calculation, right? So I'm gonna just plug this into a calculator. I'm gonna do 34.261 divided by 3.8 equals, and I get a lot, 9.01605263. I'm gonna stop there. That's gonna be grams per milliliter or grams per centimeter cubed. But what I need to figure out here is how many significant figures do I need? Well, this has five. This has two. The lower number is two, so I need two significant figures. So it's gonna be 9.0 because that does not tell me to round up. So 9.0 grams per milliliter. And then I have this one. I have a gram and I have, so that's mass. I have volume. So it says, what element is it? So first I have to find the density. So 7.49 divided by 1.65. So that is the math that I'm doing, right? So again, I need my calculator. 
I need to do 7.49 divided by 1.65 equals 4.539393 repeating. Okay, significant figures, three, three, so I should have three. One, two, three. That nine tells me round up. So 4.54 grams per milliliter, right? Or uh, grams per centimeter cubed. So now I'm gonna go to table S and see if I can find 4.54 in my list of elements. Scanning, I'm scanning. Okay, so I don't see exactly 4.54. What element is going to be closest? So if I did this in a lab, I probably made mm, probably a little mistake, and I'm going to go with this right here. Look at this yttrium, 4.47. That's pretty close. If I did this in a lab, I'd be pretty impressed. So that is simple as Y, yttrium. Okay, so Y, yttrium, okay? And those are density calculations. Okay, now we are on to scientific notation. So for scientific notation, what you need to know is that um, you need to the left of the decimal, you need just one digit, and it has to be a one through nine. So, and I need to have every single scientific notation will have times 10 to the something. So that much I know, it's times 10 to the something. Okay. Every time I'm starting with a bigger number than 1 or whatever, I'm going to end up with a positive exponent. Every time I am starting with a small number, I'm going to end up with a negative exponent. Just things to think about. What I'm going to do is there is no decimal written, so I know it is at the end. And then I need to move it over two places. So I'm going to get 7.27. How many places did I move the decimal point? Two. So this is 7.27 times 10 to the second. I move the decimal to the left, right, in order to put this in scientific notation. So left up to you. Okay. This one, well, I don't need to move the decimal. But if I still have to put it in scientific notation, the way to say don't move the decimal is put a zero. All right, let's look at this one. So the decimal, it's not written, it's over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine places I move the decimal. So 1.73 times 10 to the nine. Again, that's a big number because I went up because I moved the decimal to the left. All right, now let's look here. Here's the decimal, one, two, three. So I'm gonna get 4.1. And how many did I move it? Three, but it, it was negative. And the way you remember that is down, right, wild. Okay, so left up to you, down, right, wild. So this was three places, so it's a negative three. This one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is just nine times ten to the negative ten. Okay. All right, so what do we do here? Here we start by writing just whatever we had. So sometimes it helps just to write it in the middle uh, because you aren't sure which way you're moving the decimal. Well, this is a positive decimal. That means I'm making a bigger number. So all I'm going to do is make this number bigger by moving the decimal to the right. And I'm going to move it one, two, three, four. Okay, this one is a negative exponent, right? So I'm going to write the digits I have first, and then I'm going to move the decimal three places. So I was right here, right? I mean two places, sorry. So I'm going to move the decimal two places. I'm going to go one, two, and then I put the decimal and a leading zero. So I got a smaller number. This one, I write what I have first. I have to move the decimal 13 places, okay? And it's positive, so I'm making a real big number. So it was right here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
I can count them off. One, two, three, comma. One, two, three, comma. One, two, three, comma. One, two, three, comma. Do you see why this is useful in scientific notation? This number is hard to say. So this is thousands, millions, billions, trillions. So 59 trillion. Maybe you don't remember that. It's a lot easier to just say this. Okay, so we use scientific notation because expressing really small and really big numbers is much more convenient in scientific notation. It's also a way for us to easily see significant figures because significant figures are going to be to the left of the times 10. Okay, there we have significant figures. All right, now we're going to look at percent error, which luckily we have a formula for on your reference table. I'm going to write it in kind of shorthand, so watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this and write percent error equals measured value minus accepted value divided by accepted value times 100. So kind of just in shorthand, okay? And then I'm going to look at this very first question. So here it tells me the measured value for the atomic radius is 143. So 143 is the measured value, okay? So that much I know. And then it says, uh, based on table S, what is the percent error? So that literally tells me um, I know I have to get some information from table S. So I better open up table S, right? And when I do that, you're going to see that atomic radius is one of the columns. So all I need to do is find platinum and look up its atomic radius, which is going to be over here. Find platinum. Atomic radius is the last column. So platinum is 130. That's the accepted value. That's the right answer. Okay, and then it goes accepted value at the bottom as well. So 143 minus 130 is 13 divided by 130 times 100. Okay, and you can plug that into a calculator. Um, I can do this quick math in my head though, but I'm going to plug in 13 divided by 130 and then times 100, and I'm going to get 10%. So this one is 10% error. Remember that the closer I am to zero, the better my percent error. Because if my percent error were zero, that means I got the right answer. So 10% is actually pretty good, especially um, considering a lot of these very small measurements. So again, the closer you are to zero, the better. Whether it is negative five or positive five, those are both incredibly close to zero. So they would be awesome percent errors, okay? All right, let's look at the next one. The length of a piece of copper wire is measured to be 12.31 centimeters. The package lists the length as 12.2 centimeters. What is the percent error? So again, I have measured value minus accepted value divided by accepted value times 100. Measured value, 12.31. Accepted value, 12.2. Divided by accepted value times 100. So I need 12.31 minus 12.2. I'm going to get 0.11 divided by 12.2 times 100. Okay, so then I'm going to use my calculator and do 0.11 divided by 12.2 equals times 100 equals, and I have point nine zero one six three nine a whole bunch of numbers percent so point nine zero percent that is outstanding percent error right point nine zero percent okay and then last one here a sample of gas contains 41.8 percent oxygen when a student analyzed the sample, they reported 47.2% oxygen. What was the percent error? Okay, so again, what do we have? Measured value minus accepted value divided by accepted value times 100. So measured this one. They measured, that is 47.2. The accepted is 41.8 divided by 41.8 times 100. So I'm going to do that math, 47.2 minus 41.8 uh, is 5.4 divided by 
41.8 times 100. So divided by 41.8 equals times 100 is 12.91866. So 12.9% error. You could even say 13% error. Most of the time for percent error, we're not really worried so much about significant figures. Um, but if I am worried about significant figures, this is my right answer. So 12.9%. And there we go. That is percent error. All right, this is the last part of the sheet. This is for extra credit, um, and I'm gonna kind of explain it to you. So what you're gonna do is look for how many significant figures you see in each number, and then you're gonna color based on that. So here's the first one. This is 103 grams. Well, 103 grams does not have a decimal point. You start on this side. That first number is not a zero, so that has three significant figures. So I would color that piece orange okay so this oops of course my orange decided to break Let's see if i can get it to cooperate but this piece right here i'm just don't want to run and get another one would be colored orange this whole piece okay so let's just do another example and let's see this one right here 8.0 it does have a decimal we start on this side uh, that's not a zero, so this has two significant figures, so I would color that one yellow. Let's see if I have better luck with the yellow colored pencil, and I do. So I would color this piece yellow, okay? And you would do that for all of the numbers that you see here and color the appropriate area based on this table telling you what color to color each one, okay? And that's it.